Welcome to another draw long session on global architecture, focusing on Western culture in the neoclassical and industrial architecture period. This case will be in the United States at the US Capitol. The image we've selected over here on the right, a view from Looking up from the, the hill that it's perched on that was selected by L'Enfant to the French landscape planner that laid out Washington, D.C. And we'll look at the colossal dome that uh, got rebuilt because the um, scale of the use and performance of it with the Senate and the House of Representatives expanded it so much that the original dome seemed too small, so they took that one down and then rebuilt a larger dome in the middle of the 1800s. So that'll be our focus today. You can see the scale jump between the full model itself and just the dome itself. And we'll see some precedent studies for uh, where this design was taken from. It's the United States Capitol. It's the seat of the United States Congress, the legislative branch of the federal government located on Capitol Hill, on the eastern end of the National Mall, which is the big public space that uh, all Americans take joy and pride in. And so looking west then from the dome is this great access view that kind of takes command. And, and like most pieces like this, the intent was that no building could be built taller than this, restricted to a certain height. And that lasted till about, oh, 1910, and now, there's a sequence of buildings that are a little bit taller than the Capitol building. For instance, the Washington Monument is, the Basilica, the National Shrine, the old post office, and the Washington National Cathedral. So it still has a dominant view. Washington is not a city of towers. Uh, so it still is the most prominent piece of architecture there and the symbol of our, our freedom. So we'll start with our 20% here and start to lay out the relationship of the horizon line and the view shed for this. You can tell here we're looking up onto that hill, which will drop the horizon line fairly low. So we can find that by looking at some of the diagonals in, as in the tick marks here, where the certain wings and components of the building. So this one rushes up to about here. And so all of them are diving down to a point and they're going to collapse at a point well down here towards the bottom. Now to find the uh, right side, there's only a couple points that really return to that. So they're gonna be over here and they're also gonna rush back to a point well off the page to the right. This has a little indentation. And then finally, we've got the corner, which will be the end of our sketch over here on the right. So the horizon line is actually going to be off the bottom of the paper here for the first time because we're looking up at something that's demonstrably vertical for us. So we'll use the vegetation in the foreground here to kind of um, show its relationship to the mall to the left, out to the west. And then a little bit of the lawn creeps up here that rises up above us. So as if we're walking up the hill to get to the mount of the Capitol itself, that'll be the baseline of the sketch. And then right about at this point, again, driving on that left vanishing point, is the plinth or par V that it's located on. So once you get to the base level before entry, there is a very large base that's built for the structure. And that comes all the way over here to the corner of the structure. And then also it too makes a return to the east. So we'll have our two points that we're going to rush to, but it's dedicated by the conversions of the lines you've got started here. Make sure we follow all horizontals or remain that way. Now we've done a series of domes and pastoral on lectures. And so let's take a look at the one we've got now, which is in this phase called neoclassical. And so it's got a marriage of, again, because now we're in the 1800s and they can use the structural capacity of iron ores um, in cast iron and then later on in steel for structures and architecture. So this is a very clean sort of 
um, more formalized, pure form of classical language away from the over decorative, the ornate of the Baroque from earlier periods. That's why it's referred to as neoclassical. It strips down and takes it back to more of a Roman architecture or Greek in terms of its formality. So kind of a lineage we see here, and I'll, I'll post this one up so they can see it in perspective a bit here. Precursors for it, if we do a kind of um, based on a uh, relativity of the timeline, get this to stop rolling. Sort of the, the mother of all domes in Western culture was built by Michelangelo for St. Peter's. And that's got the same type of idea of a very large drum and necking for it and the spring point for the dome itself. So that's hemispherical here. You can see here the American dome is a bit more projected in the vertical. That's why I mentioned before that domes have personalities of their own in terms of the final geometric form for them. But before we can get to the U.S. Capitol, we've got the sequence that once this is shaped as sort of the epic center of the Catholic center of Christianity, when the Anglican Church separates with Martin Luther thesis back in 1511, the uh, later on revision of St. Peter's by Christopher Wren then is another dome of itself to compete. So this is the largest dome over here on the left, St. Peter's in Christendom. The second largest is St. Paul's. And then the third largest, as we move from uh, Rome to London, then Paris had to have their sort of domical trophy too. And they did this originally at a church called Saint Genevieve, Saint Genevieve, who's patron saint of the city of Paris. But it was completed over the course of the French Revolution. So it went from being a ecclesiastical building to um, a temple of reason and the and the, sort of a scientific place, a place to honor people. And so today it's known as the Pantheon, where it's an, um, a non-ecumenical space. It's um, secular, and so it houses all the great people from French history are turned in the crypt at the Pantheon. So you're going to see three great domes that were done prior to um, Jefferson starting to articulate the language of what would happen here in the United States in our great dome on the campus of the mall. So we'll look into that with some detail here as we sketch through that. So. And like any other shape, though, it is conforming to the rules and regulations of perspective of moving with something that's cylindrical. And so, again, if we were to do a, a circular object and it was on the horizon line down here, it would be almost like a flat line to us. As we go further and further away, that circle is going to open up and become more, have more potential to be a full circle toward the top. So the lowest one for us that we'll see at the base here, we'll start with just as a, a, a standard for us, is the top of all the columns are going to rim around the base drum itself. And so we're going to draw this arc first of the entablature at the tops of those columns. And remember, when we started, there's always a little bit of a fish hook on one side, and then it moves across the page, and opens up, and now we see it kind of disappear behind the bulk of the, the right wing over here of government. And the top of the entablature then comes up and we get to the second performance of classical language, which are windows that go into the secondary dome above that. And then finally the flare of the dome itself, the base of it rolls around. So each one of these is getting progressively a little bit bolder and more tipped open. So we see more of the underside. If we were to complete these circles, this would be the thinnest shell, a broader shell. And now we come all the way to the top and before it gets to the cupola up top, we see the top of the dome and the base of that cupola, and that really opens up. And finally, the top piece here is probably the biggest cylindrical arc we're going to do, and the closest to being a full circle. And that way, we get the sense of moving around and also going up vertically for us. So we can simply bring back the sides now. And we'll, because it is so vertical, we will do a little bit of canting in on the verticals on the edges of this, because that'll be the center line of the sketch here coming down. So in the middle here, it'll be true vertical. On the outside edge, we're going to tip it a little bit toward that extra uh, vanishing point well off the page to the top. So same is true for our boxes on the end over here. When we get to the edge of these, they'll be a little bit off center because they're pitching up in perspective towards the top. So it 
boxes out this way at the corner, comes down the plinth that it sits on. So these are all parallel lines, just tapering just a little bit towards that point way up above. And now we have just a simple routine of building all these boxes in perspective quickly. So here's the edge. The twin of this building now gets compressed in perspective. Here's the return for it. That's the exact same return there we're looking at. Then it comes out to this indentation and these two original wings. So this pops up, comes back. And now we'll have this coming down to about this corner and finally returns over. So some of the actual architecture of moving up into this space, if we look at our view shed here, we'll try to help it to it, is we're going to see this corner end up being the middle of the dome so we can rotate that around. And we're looking up at that. And so what's going to happen is we will see uh, the language of the architecture here, excuse me, on the wrong side here, the language of the architecture rotating around here. So we'll see the second piece, but now the third piece way in the distance, one, two, and three, the, the center spine for it, that looks like it's far away, but it's actually that's central underneath the dome itself. And the third piece is collapsed behind our vegetation over here on the left of the screen. So we're not gonna see that third piece. If we took it away, it'd be too diminutive. So that's a nice foreground break for us. So those are the three things we're gonna be able to see. And then this vegetation kind of rises up and again collapses on that third piece that goes back. Uh, we do have then down at the base to hold the columns wrapping around yet another flatter arc of the circle. And again, that little wrap around at the edge is important. Then we'll use the sky value against it because this is a very light tower against the sort of crystal blue sky. So we'll give a value to that. And then we try to find the exact arc of the dome that's really important to us. Because again, that's a little bit more vertical than some of the earlier domes we saw, which are purely hemispherical. This has got a little bit more of a football shape to it where it's bowed up at the top. So that's gonna come down and then sit on the dome right about there. So we'll study that lightly in 20% and you can make corrections down the road with value if you think it's too squat or too skinny in terms of its height. And then the cupola rests on top of that. And then there's the statue up above at about this scale. So the other key aspects to it are breaking down the pieces. This is just like using the classical language, obviously in the classical where you've got to have a base connection to it. So off of our plinth, then rises the height of an arcade down below. So there'll be a series of arches we'll draw in. Then up above that is the colonnade. And the colonnade in this case is, is a Corinthian order because it's, it's the hierarchy of the most prestigious building in the United States. So. Uh, that kind of order makes sense here. And so those columns are going to rise from that base level up to its entablature. And the entablature will give way to the balustrade above. So it's got that same tribulation we saw in, in Greek columns, in Greek temples, or Roman columns and Roman temples, where these columns rise up and the whole series comes across and we'll sort of, again, draw them a little bit broader than they are in real life because it's easier to make them thinner later on in the drawing than making them fatter. And they run across that front here. And they're a pretty strong subject area because that's the closest part of the capital to us. So we'll do more detail. Sort of there's our powerful third of the sketch. We articulate that better, let the building slide away to the back, let our foreground be the vegetation. So same is true for the columns wrapping around, although these are getting sequentially tighter together as they move towards the vanishing point here. In the case of these, they're furthest apart right in front of us and then bow around and get tighter on both edges. So we'll see the ones in front of us fairly spaced evenly, but as soon as we start to bend around, they're gonna come tighter towards each other. And that's really important to show. And then finally at the edge, they're actually overlapping the volume. 
So the last couple wrap around that edge there. That gets that movement going around that bend. And we do the same thing then with right above each one, there's an opening fenestration at this drum level. And that's going to wrap around tight to the side and then tight to that side. And then there's a bit of an entablature for those arched windows. They sit and float under a horizontal piece. And each one of these is, is decorative, but it's also part of the structure which binds. And so there'll be metal ties in here, which are brought in in, in the iron ore product, uh, sort of pre-steel product, and then made taut. So it actually kind of, in a sense, if you can imagine this once it's finally engineered properly and then brought to its performance, it pulls in and resists with tensile strength, which in a sense makes the, if you can think of this happening in, in a real small scale, it kind of pops up the dome a little bit, makes it rigid because the dome obviously in its arc here wants to fail and push the building out this way. The sequence of the drums and then the steel inside here with the wrap around there, the ties, uh, make it rigid and, and structurally sound then. Same is true as up here, there's a little temperature at the top, and then we see more of an arc for it, and then a ring of small colonnettes up there as well. You see the base here, which will be the pedestal for that piece. And there's a couple of roof elements that pop up here and here at the base of the drum of the dome. As we work our way now, this same language wraps around the whole facility. So it's all at the same level here, right? And that classical language ends up going on through it. So we're simply going to do those same three pieces, the balustrade, that cornice line, And wrap that all the way across. And the next column aspect is the center spine. So we've got the far right, the center, and again, the left, we're not going to draw. So this has got, it's a more diminutive. This is more of a, the number of columns is, is a little bit larger than here, but we're going to see these in such an oblique view that we're simply going to see them very close together marching across their facade. And then they come down and sit on the same type of plinth. So the plinth runs like this across. We don't see this base until it comes right over here and meets this one because it's flush with it. So that's going to be picked up right there. So that gives us an idea of where the base comes back. So it disappears a bit because we're going over this plinth down below. So we can't see it. By the time it shows up again in perspective, it's down here now and it continues to wrap around the building. So on the sides here, there is a little bit of detail in terms of the sort of uh, three-story aspect of it. At this point, we only see the second story. So once the base goes back here at Dining Out, we've got a level of windows at this height and then more of an attic story, a series of windows there. And there are four bays. So if we simply bisect that really quickly, we can find the center of those four bays in perspective. And then inside each bay, we've got that first floor tall window, two, three, and four, and the smaller one up above. And that returns over here and does the same thing. So we'll see one bay and then the second bay gets a little bit truncated as it wraps around that corner. There's one bay over here on the side. And then we get to the colonnade here on the edge which projects out from that. And so that kind of lays out our goals for this. Well, this we can also wrap the entablature and the balustrade around this edge of the building too. And then we'll stop it just with some value here but we will start to articulate them that line 
of fenestration, which is the attic floor up here. And so that has fenestration here. And then down below, on the first floor, the major primary window that we'll see on the skin there. And now that line, we'll just dot that in for now. That's the base of all the windows we'll draw behind the columns here. And this is the base of all the windows we'll draw behind the balustrade on the second floor. So first we'll do the columns to make sure you got them set. Then we'll come in with the dark for the windows because there is it's not all a flat engaged columns. It actually is a porch out there. And this returns here, top of that. And then we'll have a little break in the corner here of the architectural language. And then a couple of pilasters wrap around the edge. And we'll continue some of the vegetation here on the base on the top of the hill. So this will be lawn that takes us up to the plantings that kind of break that plane a little bit. And that'll be a nice dark base against the stone and the valley of the skies. So speaking of the skies, we'll use uh, mimic some of the cloud work here, a little more bulbous here, and content wise, a little more powerful. And that'll come up to the edge. Then there's a break in dark, and there's another series of white clouds in the distance, which will pass through and up at the top. We see the underside of these now above us. So they'll just simply fill up the rest of the page above here with the light and then drift off to this side. And again, we'll have them kind of go off on an angle. So we can find the dark area here just as a locator by washing the deeper blue of the sky with the 20% all the way up to the dome's edge. So we want that dome to be really white against the skin there. We'll do the same over here. And then take this across and the dome has got the darker tone on both sides of it, all the way up to this front elevation too. And that's probably a good placeholder for now to use that dark. And we'll make it more of a spectacle later on, but that's it's just the place of trying to how we're gonna use this guy to offset the building. And we'll start with number three now and just know that the vegetation is much stronger than the cloud work. So we can go right to number three and now do more of a profile and the start of a valley for that whole zone down here. So that's just a quick wash along the base until we get to the grass area. We'll build those up with some structure later on because there are foreground, we'll see a more detail on these later on. But then these kind of roll up and edge a nice dark at the base. And so three is just our placeholder to say, this is where we're going to put it later on and articulate that. And then we'll, we'll figure out the value we want later on for the, the lawn that leads us up to here. Here is the same type of stone and walkway that goes across the whole um, front of this. So you actually walk onto this plinth first, then enter the building. So this has got a cadence of a structural grid through a series of pilasters, which move. And so that square is going to repeat itself, but get larger each time we draw it. And it's the same distance, but in perspective, it appears like the space is getting larger here. And we finally come to the corner there. And then what they have, just for a reference point, is it's got electric light now. So there are light poles that come up and illuminate the space. And we can put a little tick mark as a reference to show that later for scale change corner and then we wrap around and do one on this side too. Okay, so three now is going to go in and show some of our initial things of what actually is deep or dark because the building is going to be mostly crystalline white. So we want to start top to bottom and show that the broadest opening here in the cylinder is the center one because we see the most of it. And the top of it will be darker and then drop down. Same is true with the one left and right of it with a little bit skinnier line and a little fine line as it comes to the openings wrapping around. So you see the most of the central arch. Same is true here. We're going to come down and draw the sort of structural spines for these, which kind of gives support to the actual skin now. And so it gets tight at the top, 
and then comes down and gets broadest at the base as it opens up towards us. It's almost like the uh, structure of a pumpkin they'd see in fall festival. And then the space in between them becomes tighter and tighter. And then the ones in front of us are almost perpendicular, but none are truly a straight line because they're moving across the scope of this domical shape. And down and down and out of that edge. And we'll make that perform better too in a little bit, but at least it gives us some sense of the movement of that. And now in between all those, there's another secondary type of, of light because this is actually planned like all these other domes that we see later on at the Pantheon in Paris or at St. Paul's where there actually is um, three domes that cities really kind of work with once the, the, the ingenuity came out. And that is, the tallest dome is the exterior urban shape. So it's got to be the structurally most dominant and has to be proportional to the size of the building. So as this grew, this had to be redesigned and built taller. So that's the one that we always think is the dome. And yet on the inside, because the scale of the interior beneath this is much more diminutive than the whole site, there's actually an interior dome which finishes off the right proportion of the space we're in relative to the interior dome. The third dome then is for acoustics, which a lot of times is a hyperbolic paraboloid one, which goes up between the two and allows the sound to go up and reflect back down to make this place a great place for acoustics as well. So when you see a cross section of any one of these domes, they're really a great spectacle of engineering where they're embracing uh, the early days of the pre-steel, the uh, cast iron, and they're building these out with um, the thought of acoustics in the space and how sound resonates and the performance as an interior space as well as a grand urban gesture, all in the what seems like a simple singular dome, and yet there's typically three for every sectional kind. So now we drop down to um, the arched area windows, and so there are some thin arches that go between the columns here. So we'll find those spaces coming up. And we'll roll those around. Again, a little bit darker at the top, pulling your ink down. And now they're going to get tighter together and more like a simple line as they make their way around that edge. So bringing those arcs closer together. And now we're going to drop that and do it again because what happens here is we see not only the front face of the entablature, we see the thickness of it between the column capitals. So the underside of that is a dark rim that go between the capitals there. So we're going to deepen those up as that runs around. And then behind that line, we can see as there's an opening, this is a very small area, but pretty important to show that this is an open air arcade out there, which um, probably the most prominent one that has that the deepest one is the Pantheon in Paris, where when you take the Oh, a couple hundred step rise up to the top there. This is a beautiful outdoor space, which looks, it's a quarter inch deep here, but it's probably 30 feet wide up there. And it's a great tourist spot for the city of Paris. Same is true here. Then you come up and there's a whole access point. There's a rail detail at the base. But then up here, we see the underside of this rim going in between the columns until it reaches the actual space definition of the rotunda inside there. And so the elevation of that rotunda has got more of these windows, although taller in scale, letting light into the dome and then kind of dispersed back into the interior. So we're gonna put those in, wrap it along there too, all the way up to whatever our side building allows us here. And so that gives us another sense of return. We've got different levels of things going around, sort of a carousel of the classical language there. And then the windows that are dark are right in front of us here, the attic story. Give us a sense. The windows beneath it. Wrapping around on this side, a little glimpse there. And it's not going to be much here because it's all fine line work, but between, if you get a sense of between the columns, it's thickest between the first two, a little bit thinner, and then finally just a series of fine lines that takes us along that back skin because we don't really see too much information there in terms of holding depth because it's so oblique at this point. 
And we'll see a nice underline for the underside of the of the cornice here before it gets to the baluster up above. So we can take that around and show a nice finishing point for it. All the way up here, we'll detail the baluster in a second. Wrap that around. So that's the uh, classical language, the finished part of the building, whether or not there's a baluster up above, that's the shaping and changing of it. And what's supporting the cornice line then obviously is the entablature. And that's got an underside just above the column height. And that too is gonna wrap around the whole structure. And it comes around this side and it meets us right about here at the tops of all the capitals. Wraps over and back there. So we had this window over here, which is the twin to these two, and then the arch down below. And so in between our columns, which is all next, we're going to see that dark between the columns. So first the columns, and so we'll start at this end and say, there's the column, there's the void. There's the column and the void. And we'll do a little bit stronger at the top, the left side of it, and then pull down, because it's always going to be darker at the top. And now the spacing gets a little bit broader as it keeps getting closer to us. Now we're finally at the corner. So the key now is to draw this underside. So if we take the underside of this projection off of the main body of the building and project it back in perspective, we're going to see that line go every other space here. And what that will do, it will show us the underside that's not receiving light. So these whole zones now between the column capitals goes darker. And now these windows, which are in between all the columns in the way back, actually show up then as this one in this space projects that there is actually at the base here, there's a window at this point, and the one behind this column shows up at that point, one behind that column at that point. So that line of windows runs all the way across, and then pretty soon they start to be eclipsed by the columns, and they only see a little bit of the window as you move away from it, so it shows the movement of space. But then directly beneath those, we also have this one, so the top of all the, <clears throat> the lower level ones here also have a depth of fenestration. So it's repetitive, but it's this classical system that's got that order and device where you can scale and manipulate things and change the language to all different types of multiple forces. That's why it was such a, a dominant uh, style of architecture for thousands of years, moving from the Romans all the way up into the 20th century. And even still today, there are some firms that that specialize in the classical language around the world. Okay, so there's our darks coming down and finally at the base here at this lower level that supports the columns and then there, um, there's an in-between baluster at the bottom here, which we'll draw in a second. But that baseline over here, which comes and returns to the corner has got an arcade of arches beneath it. So we'll start with those on this turn over here, which comes about right. Let's see, is it here? Right there. And that sits on that piece. So there's an arch on this corner facing, facing to the south. And then a series of them at the same height along here. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the center one is right in the middle of that. And then we space those apart or on each side. And they'll get thinner and closer together as we move down this way. And so those are those arches that move at that pace. And they're also going to be very dark because they're not like on the skin. They're actually sort of a vault of space that goes deep into this porch area of our support here. And again, all these points are leading back to a left vanishing point or a right vanishing point. 
Okay, at the top of our plinth, we've got a, beneath our lights, we've got a little ribbon of baluster, just like the top. So we can do it at the same time here. What you'll do is for every column, there's sort of a vertical support that's more structural that runs up. So it's a little bit thicker. Comes to the corner, there's one over here. And then that same is also held down here at the base of each of the columns. The columns come down and meet at that point. And in between, it's a very, very fine line. So it really just looks like a value up here. So we're going to leave it alone for now because if you start doing too much line work there, it just, it, it's too demanding of our hour time together. So we simply want to do sort of a cartoon version of that through a value later on. But that's all the structure where we're going to put our values from here on out. Now it's just a matter of moving up the ladder from 40 to 90 in terms of the presence of value here. So let's start top to bottom and know that on the shade side, it's not receiving that Western light here. So we can come and wrap around the underside. This is a type of material which is darker. It's not a stone statue. And now the columns on this side go darker. Fascia gets darker. And now the darks inside of here, it shows that cavity of space also become darker. So we simply keep moving that around here and show the movement of light across that. And now the last couple of pieces of dome here are gonna be not in light. So they're gonna have a value of probably 40% at least. Maybe it'll come back with more. We don't have to do a, a monolithic sort of color the whole thing in. Leave some little glimpse of light. And then from this side, the sole underside of that piece comes over. And from this part over, it kind of does an ellipse until it comes to full shade. So that'll wrap around this side and then return. And come all the way over to this side for the cast shadow. And that repeats at the next piece of entablature here. It kind of arcs. And then once it gets to a point where it's going to return away from the sun, it'll dive down kind of a long elliptical move right up to the edge of the front of this piece. Uh, and then we'll see a little bit here as well. I want to roll up and right about here, start to cut back behind this little box piece we saved up later. This is a roof detail. And then a little bit along that arc. And now certainly on the faces that don't face the sun, they're facing south. And so this is Western probably Later in the afternoon, you can see how pointing at the lower edges here. So the sun's low in the sky. So we can come to those faces on all these and simply wash out from the most key corner over to the right. Take that edge all the way down to give you a starting point, an ending point. So you can do a nice job with the chisel and pull that back and away. Do the same over here. And we'll input that later so it isn't quite so banded and striped. We'll do the same now with this skin because that was a lineal thing and now it's sort of a whole mural thing. So from this point over, we need to come in with that chisel point and kind of show the value of that dome moving away at a diagonal. Same is true for over here. That wraps around, considering the movement we're looking for. Uh, and then this skin has got these areas right here, and then the whole right side of to the edge of our drawing. So we're gonna box in this value up front here. And then starting here, coming back to the vanishing point. So we'll just kind of keep fading this out. So make it strong at the corner and just wipe it back to give us some direction of how we're gonna end the sketch over here. 
Same is true for the plinth down below. And this edge over here, which also is a mass. Then I'll pull back towards the right. It's now we started to see the light kind of turn on here and give it more presence for us. Uh, maybe we can do the underside of all the vegetation and say that there is a lower zone. We'll start to build up layers of information for that since we'll see some actual vegetative detail in the foreground a little bit. And now moving up to five, we can start to go deeper into our interior areas. So again, starting at the top, on the right side of the dome, don't go exactly where you did the four, you're going less of the area, just highlighting darks within the darks. Keep moving that around. That arc wasn't broad enough, so I'm gonna make it a little bit taller and curl it back. The second one too. And now maybe pull out a cast shadow from one of the ribs. As the sun hits and brings it down, that'll make that a, a brighter rib to look at. <clears throat> Maybe on this far end too, against the clouds, make that edge one a little bit brighter. And it fans out a little bit. And then there are little eyelets that wrap around up here, which add light at the final peak of the interior space of the dome. So that wraps around the circle too and moves at the top skin. And then the windows, just hit those, water at the top, drag it down. And they get thinner and closer together. Down below, follow that through where we did the, the underside of the entablature deeper and darker in front of us. Then the tops of the windows behind the columns will help show that edge to it. One line there as it wraps around. And now to hold out of the columns, we want to show the wall space behind it because you can see the sun will come through and illuminate that skin, but it's darker as soon as it wraps around to that corner. So we can come to the edge of some of the ones over here and start to show the edges of the columns and keep them broader than they actually are going to be. They're finely in delicate space. We're going to keep them broader in the beginning to make sure we hold on to their depth. And just the right side of those. And now here we do the underside of the entablature as it wraps around. So that little dark top there is the underside roof of the porch. So we need that to arc at that point and then show the shade side of those columns which are facing the sun. So they have one brilliant side. We'll take the dark of the sky adjacent to it because we want that column to pop out white against the sky. These are really critical areas in this dome here to be key white for us. Then keep dropping down the value back in the attic windows and the longer ones beneath it, skinnier on this side, and then a little bit at the ones that are closest to us. And then it kind of drops away and then certainly a little bit on the underside. And pulling that around, the same thing happens, just keep wrapping that around the building. And now we've got our windows we've already articulated here. We're going to Hit the five again at top and drop it down. And then finally back to the arches. Probably the, the to get the depth of it, the top of the arch rolls around and then kind of casts a diagonal shadow back. It kind of starts the language of showing it being more spatial rather than the skin of glass. When they designed this front ele elevation to show the expansion of Congress, uh, the architect Thornton uh, William Thornton was inspired by the east front of the Louvre, which is we know is a museum, but actually was the palace of the kings of France until the revolution. And the east front was done by an Italian architect and originally, and then Louis XIV didn't like the design, so he hired um, one of the Perot brothers 
who finished the East Elevation, which is probably the most successful of all the different pieces of component of the Louvre in Paris or on the River Seine. Okay, now we've got a key area where the building's casting a shadow on itself. So if the sun keeps ticking a little bit, it will come down and show a cast shadow to a certain depth, and we'll call it out with a five for now, that shows that's darker than the current interior. And that'll help pull and move that sun against it. So the same thing happens here. It comes to its matching cornice line and then project, projects a shadow onto that adjacent shift in the language of that, moving left to right. And we'll see that one more time here. This whole thing will project a shadow coming down to here. We'll see the underside of that darker. And so the underside of this whole space, because it's close to us, would be nice to show as this movement of dark along the skin a little bit. And we'll fade that out too. So come up here and show a bit more darkness right where the capitals spring up. And now just to do the same formula we did here where we want to show edges of the columns, you never actually draw the column in property, you draw the space behind it. We're going to do a bit of that because there'll be shadows cast by these on this skin adjacent to it. So for instance, this one will throw a shadow all the way over to here. And the next one will throw a shadow right behind that column and so forth. So we can drop what appears to be the edge of columns, but actually is the shadows cast by the colonnade. And that helps give more space beyond the skin itself. And so if you want to come in later with another one, you can tighten up the edge of each column against the white area, because then we have gray, really white, gray, white, gray, white. And so it marches along there and creates that, again, neoclassical cadence that we're looking for. Okay, so that should do it for five, one up to six. Repeat the same thing that five went through, but now do it in less of the areas. So start at the top, come to the right side of the statuary, underside, on the top of the cupola, inside the cupola, particularly on the right side here, all the way to this edge. And then maybe do the key ones that face us here in terms of depth for these little oval windows up top. They rip, wrap around the building. Again, the center ones that face us go darker there. A little bit of line work on the side because we're not going to see the depth because we're getting an oblique and, uh, angle looking at those windows. And same is true down here. The ones that are straight out will be powerful dark for us. Line work around the edge. Let me come back in a little strengthening of the cast shadows of the components here. Probably come in at this point and do baluster on the edge of the column. And now coming closer to us, right at the base, when we come to the edge of the depth of this pier that's holding up the arch, we see the space beyond it. So it goes dark and there's a little line of dark within that room back there. And that shows there's a bigger void beyond the actual void by the, by the arched colonnade here.
once we get to an opening where we can see more of the windows, you could put in space in between two lines to show the mechanics of a two-doored window. Same thing too with the panels up top for the smaller ones. And it turns into a line as we get further away from it. And now we can come to our vegetation and, and say that these series of trees we're going to give a nice profile to all the way down to some kind of structure holding them off the ground. So we'll wash those out with the five for now. Oh, excuse me, we're on six, six for now. And as we come to this edge, even though it's still the foreground for us, we're going to let it kind of uh, falter out on the left side over here. Because we're, again, this is setting us up to be from two dimensional to an idea for a graphic and all of a sudden become three dimensional. We'll just simply build up a layering of zones of vegetation, which will be stronger at the base, a little bit lighter at the top. And that'll come down from mature trees, maybe to the same type of tree down the hill in the distance. So there'll be zones and layers of these. Then I'll have a nice tight relationship because the lawn will roll up and the trees kind of go behind it a bit at the base. So it becomes a bit more planar over here. So this is more of a pure foreground subject. And this is just a value to support the capital to rise above here. Come back in and do the lower section of that with a value. And now we can think about probably dropping back to three. And since the uh, grass right now is just a monolithic tone, at this point on the side by the word capital over here, we got a little bit of a sidewalk coming through, but the rest of it can just be the chisel point of a three for now. And the strokes are horizontal, so it'll look graphically different than the vegetation adjacent to it. So that's enough for the five on those components now, excuse me, the six on those components. Let's go up to seven. Let's see, there's a 30. So chasing down from the top again. You can see it almost looks like black now, but we still have a couple stages left because this two will sort of fade to a lighter tone. Again, picking up darks within the dark. Each time we do this, the whites seem to become whiter adjacent to them. We'll come over to the edge here, and maybe we'll do a little bit of profile of the edge of the Corinthian here. It's a little bit of a doodling to show we're attentive to what type of capital it is. And then pull down the left side of it, to the right side of it. And then keep that pull coming down to complete its connection to the base. There we go. Now, probably to move the whole skin of this plinth away from the base, we want to come to the lip of it because it now kind of blurs right in there. And between the bastions that support it, we'll do a 70% sexualized version of that piece getting longer. And then maybe just pop up the bastion that goes above it. And a little bit on the right side of it, which is actually cast in shadow on the big white wall that it sits on. And that should be enough to kind of pull that forward and show that there's a depth when we go beyond that piece. There's a little bit of a 
three or four foot wall, and there's an arcade that runs the whole length of the building there. Now, if you go to the right side of the windows, you kind of start to see the idea of the thickness of the wall there. Certainly, the ones that are close. So, we do that on all the right sides of the windows that we've got in play. And when we can't see the right side, we can still see the top to give it depth. And those windows will burst past the values of the shadows there. Okay, before we finish up with eight and nine, let's go back to three. Uh, we started this with two originally. Now we want to go to uh, the same area there and show that the blue in the back, this is probably miles of space between the clouds up there. So the blue will change in value and become a little bit darker at the base of it as you see more color and less space in the distance. We want to push that right to this edge here and make it strongest right where it meets the building. And feed that out. Same is true over here. Build the bottom edge of that cloud a little bit, or the blue space between the cloud a little bit more. And then push it against the building. Because the only reason why we're doing this is to have that contrast and have this contrast. So I might even pull it up here and really shape the profile, the edge. This is where when one of your markers starts to dry out during the course of these draw log sessions, you get a nice kind of way to burn it in towards this, the end days of the ink and alcohol in there. So we'll come on this side and show the underside of that, give that some depth, and then let it crash right into the white, the edge, because this is an important corner because it's closest to us. So that wants to get nice and dark too adjacent to that piece, and then take it around the corner a little bit to that white. And now if you drop back to the 20, you can show that there are actually conditions of shaping of the clouds themselves. So go to the broad part of the 20 now, and you can shape some kind of clouds within the cloud. It isn't quite so monolithic. It might go all gray next to that. And in the distance, because now these clouds come back, they're the same type of formations, but they're much smaller in scale. Same size in real life, but they appeared as smaller images adjacent to our foreground perspective here. That helps pull it up now. I think you start to see the white there. And so now we'll clean it up with the final 80 and 90. Again, top to bottom, left to right, just to make sure you're passing through it all and making your assessments. Little bits here, probably two minutes on the 80, one minute on the 90, going deeper and darker. Don't be monolithic of any of them, don't do the same pattern for the wall, just kind of move about a bit randomly. And do the tops always darker? They receive the least amount of light. Then I get a little bit more detail when they come close to us. Because the more detail in the foreground actually just gets in the perceiver's eye and they make that assumption for the whole sketch, even though you're not doing the same kind of quality detailing throughout. And now those arches which support the building. So now I'm going to come back in and make a judgment before we get to the final 90%. I think I'm going to come back in with a four because for me right now, it seems like the dome itself isn't dark enough for the brilliance of this corner white here. 
So I'm gonna edge that corner to know where my limits are for that structure. And I'm gonna push more of the value of the dome up to that edge. Now I'm working with part of my sketch to help another part of it wrap around there. And so you can start with a three if you're nervous about that. It's not going to have that much of an effect and then build up, but I jumped right to a four here, right to this edge, just because then we need to have that value change. Even down here, I might even drop to a two to make sure that these are both white, but this is a closer white, making it's got to be a brighter white. So we'll take the two adjacent to the edge of this base. And then I'll help pull this corner of this architecture closer to us now. Uh, same might be true with the four to come in. Let's see. Gonna be on this edge again, right at the top down against the sky. Not the entire elevation, but certainly the key corner, which is placing the whole composition. So those could be stronger, just like probably this one up here could be stronger. Maybe this edge. That return. Little detail up here, a little bit stronger. There you go. And another thing too is that the the um, the bar of the rippling of the structure for the dome here. Make the 20 for these two, maybe, and between that edge. It actually seems darker before you get to the final one here, because now the one on this side is getting light from around that side of the dome. So it's not the edge orange dark, it's the one that's just before that. So you get a little bit of light. The, the light comes here, it has its big bulbous area of light, becomes darker, and then it has a little bit of white before it kind of makes this turn around the other side. And now number nine for the last couple of points. This point, you could be squinting and seeing what you like in terms of that value for the building, but this is probably a very spare amount. Probably the corner here that pulls that building towards us, the centerpiece is there. When you go all black, that's the final key interest. The center windows, the two or three right in the middle there center of that piece, and then build toward more representation of the black that's closest to us over here. And now quickly jump back to number six, and we'll finish off the foreground and we should be done. So there's a base of these that grow back, and so the vegetative state needs more attention at the lower level. Again, we're not doing any kind of species here, just um, a value increment. Get those over there. And what's really incredible is that this edge now is against our pure white. So I'm going to come to the edge of that and have that come down and make it meet that and really be demonstrative with how that edge layers well in front of that and send that white back into the sketch work. And then it can fade out to more of a gray over here and over on this side, but right where it hits the building, that same vegetation has to be more powerful in terms of our use. It fades away, maybe a little more of the structure here. And then in distance, it might have some horizontal lines of cast shadows beneath it to get some depth. Maybe it's true here, it kind of creates a shadow line on the grade itself. And then left to right, they could have zones with sun coming down and lighting up part of it more than the rest. So little pockets of even deeper areas of 50 or 60 in here and help move that up the hill.